Mark 15, 6 through 15. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner, anyone the people requested. One of the prisoners at the time was Barabbas, a revolutionary who had committed murder in an uprising. The crowd went to Pilate and asked him to release a prisoner as usual. Would you like me to release to you this king of the Jews? Pilate asked, for he realized by now that the leading priest had arrested Jesus out of envy. But at this point, the leading priest stirred up the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them, then what should I do with this man you call the king of Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. So to pacify the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Thanks, Peyton. Let's give her a hand. Well, hey, E Hills, if you're in the room or watching online, it's so good to be together this morning. Hope you've had a fantastic weekend, ready for spring break. I got my St. Patty's green shirt on this morning. Uh, if you are new, my name is Tom, one of the pastors, and we're just so glad that you've decided to join us uh, today. Uh, I'm going to jump straight into eyewitness part two, and I want to ask you this question. How many of you know who Zola Bud is? Anyone? Hey, all the old people, hello. Um, <laughs> She was a famous South African barefoot track and field runner way back in the 80s who became infamous after tripping the US athlete Mary Decker in the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. And it was a huge deal. I mean, it was a big controversy. There's actually an image here of that exact moment. You can see Zola Bud in the front with a barefoot running, and there's Mary Decker. And clearly, you can see it was the Americans' fault. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I remember reading about this event and the controversy around it, what actually happened. Some say it was Mary Decker's fault. Others say it was Zola's fault. But what we do know is what happened in the crowd, in the stadium, the entire stadium that day began to boo Zola Bud. Because at the time, South Africa was actually excluded from competition because of apartheid, and the Olympic Committee had made an exception uh, for Zola. But many felt like she shouldn't have been there in the first place. And the reason I tell you that story is years later, I was helping my mom clean out um, old you know, photos and shoe boxes and things, and I found this old photo of my mom and my dad at the Olympic Games in 1984 in LA. And I was like, wow, mom, I didn't even know you had been to, to America, to the Olympics, you got to watch the Olympics. And she was like, yep, when you were two years old, uh, your dad and I left you with your grandparents and we had an awesome trip to the States and we got to go to the Olympics. And I was like, oh, wow. That's so irresponsible of you. No, I mean, <laughs> but then I was going through the photos and I found this photo kind of blurry and, and taken far away from the top of the stadium, but I could see it was the exact moment that Zola Bud tripped Mary Decker. She had an old film photograph that she had taken. They were actually there. They were eyewitnesses. And as South Africans sitting in that stadium, they felt the tension of the crowd. They heard the boos. And this was our only South African athlete in the whole of the Olympics. And I was like, well, what did you do? And they said, well, we just pretended to be Americans. Um, <laughs> just blend into the crowd, you know. Um, you see, there's something different about being there. You and I can read all the stories and we can see the photos, but my folks were actually there. They were eyewitnesses. It's like going to a concert versus watching a concert. Um, my wife made me, I mean, I must maybe rephrase that. Um, I so enjoyed watching that Taylor Swift concert. It was one of the greatest <laughs> moments of my life. I made it a, about an hour and a half in. Give me credit, okay? It's like three and a half hours. It goes on forever. But anyway, um, how many of you Swifties in the room? Okay. I bet, I mean, I loved watching the concert on my TV, but I bet being there is a whole different experience, right? It's like Kendall's story last week. I loved this story, being an eyewitness in court. And Kendall's here, and I just want to say publicly in front of everyone, Kendall, I believe that you were the only right person in that whole courthouse and everyone else is wrong. Okay, amen. Okay. <laughs> but we're in this series called Eyewitness and the heart behind it is as we head towards Easter, we wanna bring you into the moments surrounding the Easter events. We wanna help you to experience and look at those events through new eyes to imagine what it must have been like to have actually been there, to have seen it firsthand. 
to have been part of the crowd who welcomed Jesus in, uh, you know, waving palm fronds on Palm Sunday, saying hallelujah. What it must have been like to stand amidst that same crowd just a few days later and hear those same voices shouting, crucify him, crucify him. What it must have been like to have seen Jesus hung on a cross and as a disciple to have felt the despair that this man that you had hoped was the savior of the world that, that, that was now dead. To have felt the pain, the disappointment, and of course, the joy on Resurrection Sunday. So we've chosen to look at the events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection through the lenses of four eyewitnesses. And today we're looking at it through the eyes of a kind of an unlikely eyewitness, and that is Barabbas. Now, Barabbas, you may not, as you've heard Peyton share the story, you may not see the relevance of Barabbas' story to your life right now, but I promise you, if you would listen, it is there. In fact, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're asking God for or believing God for or wrestling with God about, I promise you, Barabbas' story is a powerful reminder of God's goodness and grace, even in the midst of the most terrible of circumstances. So let's dive into the story today. Now, Barabbas is mentioned in all four of the gospel letters, but all we really know about him is that he was a murderer and a rebel and the leader of an insurrection against Rome. My question is, why is he even mentioned? I mean, he's not something, someone you often hear preached about, but like I said, as you kind of dig a little deep into the story, it's fascinating, especially when you begin to imagine what those events must have felt like through Barabbas' perspective, through Barabbas' eyes. And so won't you just come with me on a bit of a thought experiment and imagine with me for a moment that you are there with Barabbas, and there he is lying in chains, shackled to the wall of a cold and dark cell, awaiting his own death. He is a rebel, he is a murderer, even he admits that. Some call him an evil man, a notorious sinner. But this day, he would face justice. He had committed a crime worthy of death, certainly in the Roman judicial system of the day, and not just any death, but the worst kind of death, reserved only for the worst kind of criminal. Yet, sitting in that cell in the distance, he hears people shouting, chanting, even thinks he hears his name being called out. But in the midst of all the, the yells and the screams, there's one name he hears without mistake, the name Jesus. And Barabbas had heard of this man, though some called him the son of God. Supposedly, this Jesus was a miracle worker. He even claimed to be God in the flesh which is what had got him into so much trouble with the religious leaders of the day. Now, Barabbas had known a few people who believed that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, the long-awaited one who would rescue the Jewish people from the oppression of the Roman Empire. But, Jesus knew, but Barabbas knew that Jesus was not the first to make that claim, and he wouldn't be the last. And he thinks to himself, who does this Jesus think he is claiming to be the Messiah? The only way the oppression of Rome is ever going to stop is if someone got up and does something about it. And that's who I am. I'm Barabbas. In fact, Barabbas hated the Roman Empire so much, he was willing to fight and even kill if that's what was necessary. But just then, Barabbas hears something that makes his stomach turn and his heart stop. Shaking keys, the turning of a lock, the sound of his impending death. But then something strange the very next moment, his cell door swings open and there is a Roman soldier telling him to get up. Come on, the crowd are calling for you. They wanna kill Jesus of Nazareth in your place. Barabbas, you may just get your freedom today. Imagine what that must have been like with a thousand questions running through his mind. He quickly gets himself off the floor and walks out onto the stage before the screaming mob. And there standing is Pontius Pilate the Roman prefect or the governor in charge of this whole mess. And he's caught between Herod, between the Jewish people and between the forces of Rome and alongside him, Jesus. And in that moment, Pilate thinks he holds the destinies of these two men in his hand because he knows that the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day like this, it was customary to release one of the prisoners on death row. 
And so Pilate stands on the stage and he presents Jesus, the son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the rebel. Who do you want, he says. I mean, it's a crazy question, right? There's no comparison. Barabbas was a rightful prisoner, a man who, according to the laws of the day, should have been on death row. In many ways, he deserved his chains. Jesus, on the other hand, what had he ever done but deliver and restore and heal and love and forgive and set free? Even Pilate is taken back. He says, why? What crime has he committed? But the crowd continues to roar, give us Barabbas. And Pilate again says, who do you want? Give us Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. And so Pilate, the coward, washes his hands of the whole ordeal and hands Jesus over. Now you can imagine Roman soldiers coming up, putting the keys into the locks of Barabbas' chains and shackles, and the shackles falling from him. And just like that, Barabbas walks down off that platform and into his freedom. I mean, what must have been going through his head and his heart at that moment? as he heard the cries of give us Barabbas and the screams of crucify him aimed at Jesus. I mean, surely something must have taken place inside of him. And he doesn't even really know who this Jesus is. All he knows is that Jesus is going to die and he is going free. Now, there's no record of Barabbas saying anything in that moment, turning to Jesus and saying, thank you, I owe you my life, you saved my life. You don't see any of that, but what we do know is that Jesus stood silent, for he knew the will of the Father. It's fine, he says. Let them have Barabbas. He says, no one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. I mean, what a... What a statement, what obedience. You see, Jesus knew that the father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Hello? He knew that the father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. And in that moment, a divine exchange takes place, the life of an innocent man in exchange for the life of a murderer. And you might think, well, that's not justice. And you're right. It's not. It's grace. It's grace. And it's a grace, the kind of grace that I'm so glad God has extended to me. You know, when I look at the story, when I try to put myself into the text, a couple of things just stand out to me. First, probably the most obvious is the contradiction, the contrast between Barabbas and Jesus. But both of them wanted the same thing, if you think about it. In many ways, they were both revolutionaries. Both wanted to stop the evil oppression of the Roman Empire. Both spoke out against the injustices of the Romans against the Jewish people. Both wanted freedom for the, for the Jewish nation. In fact, get this. I mean, you may not know this, but do you know what Barabbas' name, his first name was? <laughs> Look it up. His first name was Jesus. Seriously, according to the, the early scholar Origen and many other commentators, they believe that his full name was Jesus or Yeshua, which of course was a common Hebrew name, Yeshua Bar Abbas. Barabbas means son of the father, Bar son of, like Bartholomew, son of Ptolemy, Abba father. Yeshua, son of the father. And so if this is true, the crowd was presented with a choice between two people with the same name. But the way they went about their revolutions couldn't be more opposite. Barabbas was willing to fight and even kill for his cause. Jesus was willing to die for his. Two very different approaches. Jesus was a man of love and peace who told Peter to put down the sword and who spoke about things like loving your enemy and turning the other cheek. These were radical statements for a revolutionary to make. But ironically, the, the Messiah, the messianic expectation at the time was actually far more in line with Barabbas' approach. 
You see, they were waiting for a conquering hero who would ride into Jerusalem on a chariot and overthrow Rome with force and with power. They were not expecting a suffering servant to arrive on a donkey. And so perhaps Barabbas would have been a hero to the people, a popular revolutionary, because here was someone who didn't just talk about overthrowing Rome, but who actually got up and did something about it. (laughs) And you can almost hear our own voices in the crowd. You know, he's the guy we need. At least he's doing something about it, right? He gets it done. He just tells it like it is. Jesus, on the other hand, what had he ever ever really done to fight Rome? And if he really was the Messiah, why didn't he just call down the armies of heaven and teach these Romans a lesson? I mean, I'm not trying to be political here. I'm just trying to bring us into the moment. But here's the question. Who would you have voted for? Because honestly, if if I'm honest with myself, that's a tough question because I think inside all of us, we want to vote for the action hero, the person who's going to get it done, give our enemies a hiding. There's something inside of us that wants justice, that wants to win, that wants wants revenge. And so perhaps, if I'm honest with myself, if I had been in the crowd that day, I too would have been calling for Barabbas. Maybe I too would have been shouting, crucify him, crucify him. Here's my point. As I was reading through the story again and again as preparing my heart for today, it dawned on me and I finally realized who Barabbas represents, who Barabbas really is in the story. Are you ready? He's me. He's you. We are Barabbas in the story. And even maybe you push back on that station. Maybe we're not insurrectionists or revolutionaries, but left to ourselves, perhaps we would be. And perhaps we still are. (laughs) Because guess what? There is a rebel inside of all of us. Now, some of you, I can already see you're like, well, not me. I'm a good boy. I'm a good girl. I do the right things. And I just want to say thank you for proving my point. (laughs) I'm not a rebel. And the way I'm going to prove it is by rebelling to the statement you just made. (laughs) You see, we want to do things our own way. We try to take things into our own hands. Is this just me? We want to control. We want to be in charge. Have you ever thought, well, I don't care what they say. I'm going to do it my way. (laughs) I won't sing Frank Sinatra to you. But if I were in charge, well, those guys wouldn't know what hit him. Because I know about me. There's an impatience inside of me. My wife's nodding. Mm -hmm. Um, There's an impatience inside of me. (laughs) a desire to do things my way or to control things my way. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I get tired of waiting for God to do something. And so I get ready to sort it out myself. And I stop trusting God in the process. I stop believing that his ways are best, that he has our best and my best interest at heart. And sometimes we may even hear ourselves or think to ourselves, I know the Bible says, but. But here's what I found the hard way, over and over and over again. Every time I go down that road, the road of self-reliance, the road of self-sufficiency, it always ends up costing me and causing more pain and hurt to myself and to those around me. Just like in almost every violent uprising in history where no one ever really wins. Are you still with me? And you know what? Even if you are the most rule-abiding citizen on the planet and you would never classify yourself as a rebel, I'm telling you, listen to this, we rebel against God's grace by thinking we can earn God's love or approval by doing things right or by policing other people's behavior. And all that is, all that is, is rebellion on the other side of the spectrum. We're rebelling against God's grace and provision and sovereignty like the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. It's easy to see the rebellion in the young son who runs away and squanders his inheritance. It's harder to see the rebellion of the older brother, but both sons were rebels just in different ways. And so when I read this story, I realize I am Barabbas and we are Barabbas. But then something else dawned on me. This is the good news. If I am Barabbas, then that means that I too 
have been set free by Jesus. <laughs> Amen? And you too have been set free by Jesus. This is the good news, that when we accept what God has done for us on the cross, despite our insistence on doing things our own way, despite our rebellion against God, He takes my place, He takes your place willingly and pays the price that we, that I should have paid. Tim Keller says, this is the gospel that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe, yet at the very same time, more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. I mean, this is the thing that just blows my mind about this story and the story we heard last week. Jesus, God loves Barabbas. Hello? <laughs> And you say, well, he's a bad man. He did terrible things. I know. God says, I know, but I made him and I love him. Like Kendall said last week, Jesus still washed Judas's feet. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we got everything wrapped up and sorted out our mess. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so often, I think we have a hard time as Christians accepting that truth, believing that truth, because it just seems too good to be true, too easy. And so we forget about grace. And we say things like, well, I know I was saved by grace, but now that I'm in this situation, or I'm trapped in bondage, or I'm struggling with the sin, you know, the way out is I better work harder or try harder to get myself out. And we think it's about discipline and trying harder, but that is the opposite of the gospel. The truth is, there is no answer within ourselves. That's what the self-help books will never tell you. Yes, discipline and hard work are great things, spiritual formation, spiritual disciplines, but they are not enough. Our own efforts will never be enough. There is only one who is enough, and he is the one who took your place. He is the one who stood silently on the platform and said, yes, let them have Barabbas. Let Tom go free. Take me instead. So often I think Jesus is trying to take our chains off, but we stop him because of our pride, because of our insecurity, because deep down we think we don't deserve to be free or we're not good enough or we'll never be good enough. But Jesus says, Jesus says, and it's not about what you've done. Give me your pain. Give me your hurt. Give me your shame. I will take it. And so perhaps for some of you here today or listening online, perhaps your greatest challenge is not your discipline or your devotion. Perhaps your greatest challenge is simply accepting God's grace. Could it be, could it be that there is a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive, that we can come to him as we are with all of our stuff and stand in the empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that we deserve. So that is why in just a few moments, we're gonna take communion together. I'm gonna pause my sermon, I'm not done yet. In fact, the next part is even more important, but for now, we're gonna pause the sermon and we're gonna take communion together as a congregation. And if you're watching online, you can do that at home as well. There, there are tables all around the room. The band are gonna sing a song over us and while they do that, make your way to one of the tables, grab the communion elements. You can take them back to your seat and when you're ready, sometime during the song, take communion in your own time. And remember, everyone's invited to the table. <laughs> and let me just say this, as, as we take communion, don't, don't rush through this moment. As you hold those elements in your hand, let them be a reminder of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, of what Christ has done for you. As you look at the cross, be reminded that Jesus took your place there. As you look at the bread, be reminded of Christ's body broken for you. And as you sip the juice or the wine, be reminded that Christ's blood was shed for the forgiveness of sins, your sins and mine. Why? So that we might go free. So as we prepare our hearts for this moment, let me just read to you Isaiah 53, written thousands of years before Jesus, about Jesus. It says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. God knows your grief. You turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. 
Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. So when you're ready, let's take communion together. Still speaking your love, still 
still need time to take communion, then now you can, you can do it. Now's the time to meet with God, to remind yourself his body broken for us and his blood shed for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the son of suffering, that we thank you that you paid a price for us. Thank you that you set us free. Thank you, Lord, that by your blood, we don't have to stay shackled by guilt or shame or by our past. Thank you, Lord, for taking our place. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You guys okay? (laughs) We're gonna shift gears a little bit as we head towards the end of our service, but... We're not done yet, but with the time that we have left, I just want to kind of, now that we understand that we are all in some way, shape, or form rebels, that Christ has set us free, what I want to look at is how do we stay free? How do we stay free? Paul writes in Galatians, he says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. In verse four, he says, for if you're trying to make yourself right with God by obeying some list of rules and regulations, you have misunderstood God's grace. You have fallen away from God's grace. So how do we stay free from a a life of sin that keeps us trapped in bondage and from a life of striving that misses the grace of God? Now, I wish we knew what happened to Barabbas after he was set free, right? I mean, I mean, what did he do? Did he, did he live his life fully after that, fully appreciating all that God had done for him, this second chance he'd been given at life? Or did he just return to his old ways, squandering the freedom that had been bought with such a high price? All of us face that decision every time we head out into our day, head out from this place. And we don't know what happened to Barabbas, but I know what I want to do with my freedom. I want to live free, Amen. Embrace, I'm a child of God who the sun sets free is free indeed. Embracing all that God has for us and making our life count for him. I hope that that's what you want for your own life. So how do we do that? Well, I think in order to stay free, I wanna leave you with three uh, attitudes, three ideas that I think will not help us to not only be free, but to stay free. And the first is this, that we would learn to live gracefully. Say gracefully. Full of grace, understanding and accepting the scandal of grace that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That there is nothing that you or I could ever do to earn God's love or to make God love us any more or any less. That we would have the courage to not only know this in our heads, but to know it in our hearts, to believe it to the very core of our being. 
Too many people I meet these days, whether Christian or non-Christian, they're walking around with guilt and shame. And sadly, sadly, the church has often been an agent of guilt. We love you, but we'll love you even more if you clean up that mess, right? And the problem with that is that guilt paralyzes. It never really moves us to change or to do better. At best, it motivates us for a short while, and then when we mess up again or we fall short, we feel even worse, and so what do we do? We hide and we blame. I read an interesting statistic that smokers who are made uh, uh, to feel guilty about smoking are twice as likely to light up. (laughs) Guilt does not lead us to freedom. The paradox, of course, is that when we begin to understand God's grace, His unmerited and undeserved favor, then guess what? Our behavior does begin to change from the inside out, not in response to a should or an ought to, but rather as a free choice of the will in response to a loving Father. Are you with me? Staying free is about learning to live gracefully and then, of course, extending that grace to others who need it too, knowing that it is by grace that you and I have been set free in the first place. It's about understanding that we are all recovering rebels. Give the person next to you a nudge and turn to them and say, I'm a recovering rebel. (laughs) Some of you have forgotten the recovering part, just rebels, okay? (laughs) Okay. I'm a recovering rebel. And you know what? Living like with this kind of attitude, it helps us when we meet other Barabbases in our life. Yes? Because you're going to have those kinds of people all around you. Some of you are like, I'm married to a Barabbas. So, um, <laughs> but when that happens, instead of us getting all wound up or all self-righteous, we can be gracious because we recognize our own rebellion in those around us. Amen? The second way that we can stay free, live free, is that we learn to live gratefully. Say gratefully. Gratefully. Wow. (laughs) Did you guys hear that? It's the voice of God. My goodness. Okay. Um, (laughs) You guys have been here too long. Okay. Okay. We learn to live gratefully, acknowledging that our freedom has been bought with a price. Here's the truth, guys. Every day we get on this planet is a gift from God. Every breath you exhale, every moment with friends and family around a table, every sunrise and sunset, did you see the sunrise this morning? Incredible. Every opportunity to travel, it all comes from Him. And we live in a world where it's far too easy to forget that. And we get caught up in the rat race and we get caught up by complaining and criticizing and comparing, so focused on what we lack that we miss what we have. Sometimes right in front of us or sitting next to us. You know, I've walked with people uh, as a pastor through, th- over the years through terminal illness, standing on the side of beds and hospital beds, and, and I count it a privilege to stand with people in their pool of tears. But sometimes, sometimes God has done miracles, and people who are expecting to not make it get a second chance at life. And you know what's amazing about those people? So often, they're filled with joy. They have an appreciation for life and a desire to seize the moments of life that I find contagious because they know something we forget, that every meal they get every day is a bonus. It's a gift. And imagine if we could learn to live like that every day. This is what it means to live free and to stay free. Final one. If we are to stay free, then we must learn to live lovingly. Say lovingly. The difference between Barabbas the revolutionary and Jesus the revolutionary was the way they thought the revolution should happen. Barabbas thought the best way to overthrow Rome was with force, to fight fire with fire. And Barabbas is not alone. Many throughout history have tried this method, but in almost every case, all it does is incite more violence and both sides to a deeper hatred towards one another. God has a different way. Jesus did not come with a sword, but with a new kind of revolution, a revolution of love. And if you look through the history books, think about it. The spread of the early church is the story of a peaceful revolution with no parallel in history. And the crazy thing is, the Roman Empire is no more. Now there is a cross in the Colosseum in Rome. (laughs) 
The, the followers of the way did end up overthrowing the Roman Empire at the end of the day, but it wasn't with force. Rather, they did it with love and with sacrifice. Some of them, in fact, sacrificing their own lives. The Jewish people, they thought the Messiah was going to come with armies of angels to wipe out the Romans. And I guess God could have done it that way, but instead he chose a different way, a baby in a manger, a son of suffering. So we too must choose a different way. Unfortunately, in our world today, we still buy into the, that messianic expectation. We think that greatness is measured by power or influence or success, and we think we must rise to greatness. But Jesus says the exact opposite. He says, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. It's what theologians call the descent into greatness. Philippians 2, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross, Barabbas's death on a cross. Please hear me. The God of the universe humbled himself and died a criminal's death. And so for me, learning to stay free means learning to live like Jesus, sacrificially and lovingly. Laying down our privileges for the sake of, of others. And so when someone says something mean about you this week or to you or behind your back, instead of getting all ramped up and ready to you know, respond or write that nasty email, Imagine we simply responded with love and grace and humility instead. And when someone is in need and you really don't feel like helping, when it's a real inconvenience, imagine you did it anyway with no hope for reward or recognition or that they would return the favor, but simply out of love. I'm telling you, e -Hills, if we can commit to these things, learning to live gracefully, full of grace, gratefully and lovingly, I'm telling you, we will experience a kind of freedom the world simply does not know. So as we close this morning, I wanna go back to the eyewitness story. And like I said, we don't know what Barabbas, what happened to Barabbas. Some say he was there at the cross when Jesus died. Others say he started another insurrection and died in the process. But I like to think that he grabbed hold of his freedom. That God did something in him on that day in that divine exchange that stayed with him for the rest of his life. I like that story. I like the idea that life for Barabbas did not end at the cross because guess what? It doesn't end at the cross for us either. In fact, the cross is not the end. It is only the beginning. Amen. And that is why Paul goes on in Philippians 2. We read it earlier, but I want to read it to you again. But listen for the second part. He says this, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave, was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And therefore, therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's stand and let's sing together.